little yellow bass. <laughs> we have a rich diversity out here. If you, if you take a ride on the bayou, you almost always are going to see something. The sea lamprey are called the vampire of the Great Lakes because they attach and drink the blood of our native fish species here. You can see just one ship after another next to each other, creating this intricate array of reefs in this river and in this bay. My dad is from Ville Platte, Louisiana, which is a small Cajun town in the central part of the state. And my mom is from New Orleans, so some of my friends call me a, a Cajun hybrid. <laughs> Catching a few? The French, they came down from Nova Scotia, from Acadie. And the English are notorious in history for kicking the French out of Acadie. The majority of them settled in South Louisiana. And so that's where the origins of the Cajun people came from. Called catfish bodies before. So much of what we like to do in Louisiana is to go out into the swamps, the marshes, and either fish or hunt or bird watch. My dad was a fisheries biologist for the states. When I found out I could get a degree in fisheries, well, that's what I want to do. And so for about the last eight years, I've been the head of the Department of Biological Sciences here at Nickel State. Very fortunate to have that, that job. Look at that. <laughs> Oh, oh, that one. Look at that, a little yellow bass. <laughs> so again, these little cuts here aren't too bad of a place to fish. <laughs> we have a rich diversity out here. If you, if you take a ride on the bayou, you almost always are going to see something. Whether it's a fish jumping, a fish splashing, or a bird, you know, an alligator, or a turtle, there's, there's so much life down here. We do see the effects of climate change. The land is not as elevated today as it was several years ago. So we have almost like a double whammy. We're losing the elevation of our land and the sea level is rising. And so those two factors together are really accelerating coastal land loss in Louisiana. Land loss will affect Cajun culture. We know that. Cajun men cook. And what's funny is every man down here who's a cook, he will tell you that he learned from his mother. <laughs> you know, so the Cajun women around there can cook too. The origin, of course, it was the French settlers that came here first. And so a lot of French style Cajun is very rustic. We grow a lot of rice in Louisiana, so rice is a big mainstay. You know, we always think about having the, the meat. I get just as excited about the vegetables that we cook. So I use canned corn because I don't grow my own corn. All right, watch this. Watch this. It's called the corn mock chew. And usually the way we do it is we smother down corn with onions and peppers and garlic and stuff. And some kind of a smoked meat, whether smoked sausage or smoked tasso. I was so fortunate. Our family, we've had some camps, and the purpose to go to the camp is to go hunting, to go fishing, or just to go cook and relax with friends. We sit around, we cook on these types of stoves. Everybody I know, they have a stove like this. It's just a propane stove, two burners. Kind of like background music, it's nothing. Yeah. A lot of the meals take a long time to cook, so it's not like there's one person in the kitchen cooking while everybody sits in the living room. It's everybody's in the kitchen. And so while we're cooking, we're in the kitchen, we're stirring the pot, we're also socializing. We're talking to each other. So things are a little hectic when we first start cooking, when you're browning and you're doing the onions. It's kind of hard to keep in control of everything. But once you get everything back in the pot and it's all set, we got a special setting on our stove, and it's called drink. 
And so you get the stove set, everything in the pot, you turn it down nice low and go sit down and fix a drink and relax. And so we'll be there soon enough. And we'll play some music then. The traditional Cajun music is what the, our Cajun ancestors played starting back in the, you know, the 1700s, 1800s. The fiddle and the guitar came about. And they would play in dance halls, they would play at each other's house. You know, there was no internet, no TV, and so what do you do? Well, you sit around and play music and, and have a dance on Saturday nights. Traditional Cajun music is, is almost always sung in French. Almost every song, the lyrics are about someone's girl leaving him or someone dying or, or he's in prison and he misses his mama or he's drinking too much or he's hung over and that's, that's what the songs are about. You can find Cajun music out there. But in the region where we live, we saw a decline in the music. So we formed the Cajun Music Preservation Society, me and a few friends. We host open Cajun jams so people can learn the music. Um, young people can learn the old songs. And the community has embraced us tremendously. Yahoo! That was good. That's awesome. When I see water come up like that, because of a very small storm that's very far away in the Gulf of Mexico, it makes me nervous. Fifteen years ago, that storm would not have put that much water in the parking lot at the boat ramps. All right, you might as well fill the bucket, right? One of the things that we do <laughs> with our graduate program is small-scale restoration work. We bring our students to the coast every fall and we collect the mangrove seeds. So we can get them here, any way you can go around, I think you, know, you can access them that way. This one's pretty good. And we bring those seeds back to campus and we grow them out for a year and then we bring those out the following year. And we plant those and we collect some more seeds. Now, so these are some mangroves that we planted last year and these little, we call them these, these deep pots. So we can bring out these mangroves and straight right here, that's 50 plants in there. Bring that out to the beach or the barrier island or where we want to plant them and pop them out, stick them in the ground. It's out really easy. It's scary. When we look at the land loss projection maps going up for the next 50 years, they always do a scenario of no actions taken. But if we do some types of restoration, we won't lose as much land. So much of Cajun culture in the Bayou region is the livelihood. Our shrimpers, our crabbers, our oystermen, they're the ones who are going to be impacted by the, the coastal changes. Some people say that, well, we've lost almost everything there is to lose. I disagree. I think that there's a lot left to lose for us, and we need to stay strong and we need to continue to use the best engineering that we can to rebuild and restore our coastal wetlands. obvious feature of the sea lamprey is the uh, suction cup shaped mouth. We call it the oral disc. It's uh, just a, a perfectly round mouth. The sea lamprey mouth is completely lined and, and ringed with teeth. It has about 150 teeth inside that mouth and that allows them to really latch on and hold on to a prey fish. My name is Scott Meals. I'm a fish biologist with the U.S. Geological Survey stationed here at the Hammond Bay Biological Station in northern Michigan. The sea lamprey is an ancient jawless fish. It's, it's a very snake-like fish. A lot of people confuse them with eels because they do look very eel-like, but they're a completely different family. The sea lamprey are called the vampire of the Great Lakes because they attach and drink the blood of our native fish species here. They use their, their suction cup mouth 
to attach onto the side of the fish. They're able to create a, a suction force about seven times greater than your average household vacuum cleaner. And then they can also rasp into the side of the fish with the teeth that line that suction cup mouth. They'll stay attached to the prey fish uh, as long as that prey fish is healthy. They end up ultimately draining so much blood and, and juice from the fish that uh, they, they kill it. A single sea lamprey will kill about 40 pounds of fish prey uh, in its lifetime, which occurs in about an 18-month period. In Lake Huron behind us, there are anywhere from 80 to 150,000 parasitic sea lampreys swimming around right now. Probably the sea lamprey is one of, if not the most devastating species to uh, have invaded the Great Lakes. The sea lamprey actually swam or hitched a ride um, into the Great Lakes uh, through the canal system. So as the canal systems were being built to connect the Great Lakes to the east coast to the Atlantic Ocean, from there it only took a, a decade or, or two to really completely infest all five of the, the Great Lakes and wipe out the native fish populations. Specifically, one of the, the research projects that we have underway is um, trying to develop a, a tool where we can selectively pass fish. So right now we're actually using one of the, um, the Woosh Innovations uh, scanning devices and we're traveling around to uh, various locations around the Great Lakes working with uh, state management agencies, collecting uh, the fish and collecting images of those fish. Uh, those images are then going to be used to okay. develop an, an algorithm where we're, we're developing fish recognition technology, I guess you could say. Sea lamprey control has two primary methods. The first is to use barriers and dams to keep adult sea lamprey from reaching spawning habitat. Where larvae are produced, there's a lampricide, which is a compound that specifically kills larval sea lamprey that's applied. and. Uh, removes larval sea lamprey from the streams before they metamorphose and go out into the lakes and kill fish. So here we're sorting according to male and female. So the females, uh, the way we can tell, is of course they're full of eggs, uh, from 60 to 80,000 eggs in there. And then the male is uh, a tighter belly and a dorsal rope. On the top, there's a good example of one right there. The work we're researching is whether or not we can reduce reproduction. So the males come in from the trap sites, and we make sure that all the males are sorted from the females, so we're only injecting males. They then get transported inside the facility where they're injected with a chemosterilant. We just kill the female and we release the sterile male. The reason we fin clip the animals is so we can tell they're sterile. If we catch a lamprey in a trap and it has fin clips, then we release it because it's, uh, it's on our side. So this is the, the top fin here. This is the tail fin. All right, I'm going to run these. Yep. These animals are our secret agents or double agents. They don't know they're sterile. And when we release them, they go out and find the females in these huge river systems. It would be extremely hard for people to go out and find these animals. But these males are doing all the hard work for us and they, they don't even know it and they don't need to know it. It's a very humane way for them to finish their life in some ways. That's a little, there we go. All right, that's a bigger one. Oh, it's so slippery. <laughs> when sea lamprey first invaded the Great Lakes, many people suggested, have you considered actually fishing for sea lamprey? Maybe people would be willing to eat them. But unfortunately, that method failed for multiple reasons. People in the Great Lakes region simply didn't have the palate for sea lamprey. Now, interestingly, sea lamprey are considered a delicacy in other parts of the world. Spain and Portugal, you could find sea lamprey on a menu as the high dollar market price item. 
so many people ask, will a sea lamprey attack me while I'm out swimming in the Great Lakes or in one of the streams? And the answer, thankfully, is no. Sea lamprey can tell the difference between warm and cold-blooded organisms. We are warm-blooded, and the fish that sea lamprey feed on are cold-blooded. Most sea lamprey would swim very quickly away if they came near a human. The fishing economy is very valuable to the Great Lakes region. It's a part of our way of life within the Great Lakes, and that way of life, the Great Lakes as we know them, would not be as they are today had it not been for sea lamprey control. Well, I started lobstering as a summer job as a kid when I was 14, and then lobstered every summer until I went to college for about a year and then dropped out and started lobstering year round. So I've been lobstering for 35 years in total. All right, so that is a beauty. So every lobster, has to be at least three and a quarter inches to keep it across his back. So what we do is we hook this right behind the lobster's eye, the back corner of his eye socket, and then we watch carefully to see where this point touches. If that lands on the lobster's back, he's big enough. If it touches beneath the back, he's too short. And you can see that one easily touches on the back. This one we can keep. Every time we get a keeper lobster, we have to check the sex. So on the females, we're always looking for eggs. And when a female is carrying her eggs, the entire bottom of her tail would be covered with thousands and thousands of little black dots. So if we catch one of those inside the trap, we're gonna set her free. But before we do, we're gonna mark her as a breeding female. So what the lobsterman does is we take something sharp and we leave a scar on the second tail flipper from the right. We actually mark it with a scar. So that scar indicates that she's a breeding female. So even after she's thrown back and the eggs are released into the sea, we're always checking the sex and we're always checking females for a mark. If the female has a mark, she gets thrown back for the rest of her life. The main fishermen thought this law up and had it passed in the 1930s to protect the breeding females. And it's not a perfect system because it is possible for a female to carry eggs but never happen to walk in a trap and get the mark, but we're saving the majority and certainly enough to keep our lobster population very healthy in the state of Maine. I'll just go through the measuring process and is that a little bit too short. So you can imagine that once we mark a female, she's gonna get thrown back from the trap year after year after year. So eventually, we have a lot of very large breeding females in our population. Those large females need a similar sized male to mate with, so we also need to protect some big males to mate with the big females. So we've already used the short side of the measure of three and a quarter inches, but the back of the measure is five inches, and that's a maximum size limit. In the state of Maine, you can't keep a lobster that's over five inches on the carapace, so that guarantees that we preserve some big males to keep mating with the big females that we've saved by notching their tails. But this is one of the primary reasons why our lobster population in the state of Maine is still so high. We're doing such a good job to conserve the breeding females. I really enjoy doing it. It's a lot of hard work, but I think the, the reward can be there. And every year is different. I mean, some years you catch a lot of lobsters, some years you don't. So uh, you can never really rely on the income entirely, but you just work as hard as you can and then let the chips fall where they may. So we're at Mallows Bay, which was just recently designated as a National Marine Sanctuary. And what's special about this place is that it contains over 200 ships that were sunk here. And one reason they focused on this place is because it's the largest collection of shipwrecks in the Western Hemisphere. 
and 100 of those ships is known as the Ghost Fleet. In World War I, there was a big effort by the United States to build a fleet of ships that would help them win the war. So at 40 ports around the country, they built these wooden steamships, which were the technology of the day. But unfortunately, those boats were all finished after the war was completed. If you look at an aerial photograph of this area, you can see just one ship after another next to each other, creating this intricate array of reefs in this river and in this bay. You can see this ship in front of us. It's the only um, metal ship here, but that's an old ferry, and that used to ferry people from the eastern shore of Virginia across to Norfolk. And this is a tidally influenced river and bay, so as the tide goes out, the ships come up. And it's a great experience to kayak around these ships, to see the wildlife, to learn about the history, and get some exercise. What you're looking at in front of us is the hull of an old ship, one of these steam ships. And that piece of stone sticking out there was originally in the bottom, or the hull of the ship, and it was balancing the ship. We noticed a lot of them are, are like floating flower pots. They're full of vegetation, and it's, it's tremendous for the environment. They're actually cleaning the water. They're providing habitat. Um, they're actually helping with climate change. Because it's underwater, it doesn't receive as much oxygen, and so the decay rate is a lot slower. It's also salt water, which uh, further reduces the rate of decay. We have nothing from World War I. I mean, really, nothing left. And that's why this is so important. It's the largest collection of World War I vessels. And the fact that they were built for one purpose. They never told the poor guys who were going to serve on it that they expected a lot of them to be expendable. They were just figuring if they built a 1,000 of them and 600 made it across, then they could get bundles to our, our allies. They didn't tell these guys that you're, which I think they all know when they sign up, that by the way, you are yeah. government property and you are expendable. Yeah. But you know, when you think about it that way, that's why these ships were built so quickly and so cheaply, is that they largely looked at, if we build enough of them, the U-boats won't get them all. So it's, it's a bit scary in that regard, but um, it's, it, this is the only place you can see the, the size of these vessels and the size of the collection and the fact that they are a cross-section of a different number of designs. It, it is like one big museum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.